We are activating your unique self-discovery one show at a time. The Orchard of Wisdom Self-Discovery Podcast at your fingertips, just waiting to inspire and invite you in discovering just how awesome you really are and how to navigate through life in joy, enrichment, personal abundance, in mind, body, spirit, heart and soul. All the people we bring you are here to serve you on your journey of life. Do enjoy our next show. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of Mental Health Awareness right here on selfdiscoverymedia.com. I'm your host, Sarah Troy. My wonderful guest today is Kimberly Best. Conflict, how do we do with it? What is the biology of conflict? She says revolve uh, revolve conflicts in a productive, non-litigious way using meditation, facilitation, collaborative problem solving. And what really is conflict? Conflict is something that maybe might be more inquiring, but we decide to go volatile with it why and we're also going to be talking about her book today how to live forever a guide to writing the final chapter of your life which sounds very very intriguing she said that the use of dispute resolution practices are vast including meditation facilitation restoration practices peer meditation in schools and if we all learn to improve our conflict skills we can contribute to a peaceful building Meditation is what uh, what she chooses and the biology of conflict, why we do what we do and confidence conflict skill that will work. She is a RN, an MA, an author, a speaker, a Tennessee Rules 31 listed civil trained family mediator. She's a professional conflict mediator and we're going to be talking about the passion that she has to resolve others' conflicts in a productive and using those facilities we talked about before and really kind of understanding what conflict is altogether because you know we we're very volatile creatures and i think at the present moment because we're looking at the world with such dis-ease you know um there's so much going on and we're bombarded by so much and there's so much division and instead of looking at hearing somebody's argument uh or perspective, let's not say argument, perspective, and sharing your own perspective and being open to each other's perception, uh, we picked up the pitchforks and go into conflict straight away. Why is that in our nature, Kimberly, and how do we erase it? Welcome to the show. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I just want to clarify that I really don't do any work in meditation. It's all in mediation. Mm -hmm. um, but I will say that when I started working in mediation 10 years ago, if you Googled mediation, Google would say, you mean meditation. So <laughs> mediation, <laughs> mediation is a pretty new way of um, handling conflict. And um because conflict does exist, as you pointed out, it is normal. I mean, even our cells are in conflict. Uh, just most of us haven't learned how to deal with it well. And lots of things trigger conflict. I mean, I call it stepping on our toes, like we will step on each other's toes. Mm -hmm. For as small as misunderstanding the meaning of a word, we all have different ideas of what even just a word means, um, to being triggered. You know, and, and I'm sure you've talked about triggers. They're always something in the past. Mm -hmm. Somebody walks into a booby trap that they didn't make and didn't even know it's there. And we don't recognize it until, you know, we've reacted. So um, we have histories of patterns of how we deal with conflict and they work until they don't. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they work in a way that isn't helpful to a relationship. For example, if it works for me to run from conflict, it still isn't resolving the conflict. So um, I work with people to help them figure out a better way to get through conflict. That is a win-win besides the outcome, but also relationally. Um, you know, conflict, we, we want to look at the word negatively, don't we? Um, but, you know, you mentioned about being in conflict with ourselves. And, you know, when we're at that kind of crossroads, we're in conflict of where to go or what to do or how do I react to this? And I think, you know, one of the big mm -hmm. things that we need to learn to do as human beings is simply pause, take a breath, take a moment, look at the situation before you react to it, because we can be conflicting, but we don't have to be confrontational. 
And you know, when we're conflicting, is it's the it's the inner psyche inquiring. You know, why do I feel like this? What am I meant to do with it? Where am I meant to go? But we're so busy kind of wanting to react or get one up on someone that we don't pause, do we? Right. Right. No, you're exactly right. A wise friend of mine said recently that we need to understand that just because I don't agree with you Mm -hmm. doesn't mean I'm against you. It means I'm me. And I'm me because I'm a different biology, because I've had different life experiences, because I'm at a different place in my life. You know, um, it doesn't mean that we're enemies or that we need to be enemies. It just means we're different. And why have we got to such a point in time where being different is so confrontational? You know, it's it, we a lot oh, of that is media, right? It's stirring it up. It's that mm-hmm. part of that division. You've got to be this way, or otherwise you're wrong. Everything about you is wrong. Instead of looking as, you know, mm-hmm. like Forrest Gump, like a box of chocolates, and we're all just a beautiful different flavor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wouldn't that be lovely? I mean, we're hardwired for some of these things just to protect ourselves, mm-hmm. right? So those are... Those are our reactions. And, and you know, they work when we're in danger. But our brain perceives danger in disagreement the same way our brain perceives danger if someone holds a gun to your head. Mm. It feels life-threatening. So we do have the ability to slow down, which is exactly what it takes, and um, decide, is my life really in danger here? Um, and I just want to mention to the right wrong, uh, it is true, the one-upmanship that you talked about and the need to be right. Um, and another wise friend of mine told me a while back, she said, you know, when I argue with my husband, I always win because I'm better with words, because I'm more forceful. I always win. But one day I decided that I wanted to, that when I had to win, I had to make him lose. Mm. And I wanted to love enough that I didn't have to make someone lose. And that works with right and wrong, too. When we have to be right, we have to make someone else wrong. Right. And is that really who we want to be? Because, Mm. you know, we can share that space. We don't have to take it all. And I think we just have to learn that these are options. Mm -hmm. For me, a lot of my clients think they have two choices. I can do this or I can do this. And what mediation does is is the whole spectrum between this and this what is on here that you can do because there is probably literally always more than two choices it's like a, a recipe you know it's like I'm going mm. to do it like grandma do it it's got to be done precisely the same way with the same ingredients but you know maybe the product that she used has changed so it's going to change the recipe and really it really it's like using the recipe as the inspiration, but your interpretation of that recipe, it doesn't make the dish wrong. It is just a representation of your interpretation. That's a beautiful analogy. And and what speaks into that is flexibility. Um, you know, and I think that ties for, for me, what I see in conflict a lot of times is we're tying the past to what is present. Mm -hmm. So I know what he's going to say. I know what she's going to do. We don't know what the other person, but once we make up our mind, they don't have even a chance of getting it right because we've already decided how they're going to do it. So we rob them of an opportunity to be someone different than that picture of them that we have. And and these are, it's all normal. We do this. We do this because our brains are taking in so much information so quickly and uh, we're wired to do things fast, but that doesn't work <laughs> except for in that second. It doesn't work long-term for relationships. You know, it's, it's, it's not really the truth. It's our brain tricking us into a truth because it's easier. And that relationship you talk about is not just with a spouse or boss or family, but it's also with ourselves, isn't it? No, that's a beautiful point. I personally wrestle with the, um, you know, some people will say that you have to love yourself before you can love someone else. Uh, I've, I've been trying to figure out if that's a true statement or not. But I do know that it is important to know compassion. And if Mm -hmm. you have it for someone else, to extend it to yourself as well. 
I want to say in that, you know, I life is an experiment. It's mm. just every moment is one we've never been in before. Right. And sometimes we'll get it right. And sometimes we're going to make mistakes. And we are in a time now where no one's supposed to make mistakes. And that's mm. not realistic. Mm-mm. I think it's a reflection of how hard we are on ourselves yeah. that we're that hard on other people. Um, but it's okay to be human and being human means that you're not always right. I think a lot of that That's comes okay. from this, this need to compare, you know, compete and compare mm. two words. I do not like in, in the contents of, of us as human beings. Um, I am uniquely who I am. Uh, the only competition I have is, is with myself and my own growth and if I'm going to compare myself, mm. now you can see someone's style and say, I really like that. I resonate with that. I can take a pinch of that, mm-hmm. like in that recipe and add it to my own because it's such an inspiration. But if we're ch- constantly comparing, you know, our success to somebody else's success, we don't know the struggle they've had to get there. We just see the success. Mm-hmm. And then we think we're failures because we haven't had the same success because we've decided to compare. We're doing it to ourselves. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're talking about learning from someone else versus the comparison. So we see something we like. Yeah, yes. we can model that. That's the yeah. best of humanity, I think, when and we learn from each other. And complimentary to the other person too, right? Right, because, yes. that's right. But the comparison, I think, is toxic. Yes. And I think it's it's poison to us and the other person. For this reason, we always only see a snapshot of a person and we make up our mind about them in that snapshot when they have an entire life story. And when we're comparing, we are either comparing our worst Mm -hmm. to their best. Oh, my family never looks that good. My family's never that together. I never, or we're comparing our best to their worst. I'm better than them. I would never do that. Uh, You know, whatever comparison is, it's not equal because it can't be because we're not in their shoes. Right. If we can use empathy long enough to get in their shoes, we won't need to compare. We will understand that we're just seeing a snapshot and that snapshot is just a, a frame of what their whole story is. I am one to, you know, on the bandwagon of, you know, loving ourselves to know how to love another. And also in that mm-hmm. love vibration of what you resonate out is the invitation for others to love you in that same frequency. Um, and, but I think that also goes not just to loving and finding love of a mm-hmm. spouse, but loving who you are, why you are and what you're doing. You know, we talked before the show, we're both in our 60s and we kind of, where's the rocking chair on the porch and where I should be taking it easy? And why are we still compelled to do the work that we're doing? And, you know, my theory is that the, the consciousness is rising and the wisdom is needed. And we understand that, you know, we understand that it's taken us 60 something years to get to this point of knowledge. And it's not for us to hoard or just put in a trunk or in a dusty attic somewhere. It's for us to share, to make those that are coming after us lives easier. And that's where I think a great deal of the pause kind of comes in when you're young and you're rushing, pause and have that conversation with someone that's a few years ahead of you because the tips <laughs> that they're going to share with you are going to share a great deal of grief that you might otherwise go through. No, I think you're exactly right. Not only will sharing wisdom maybe help the next generation. I have five kids, so and I'm just kind of a teacher at (laughs) at heart. And um, I I feel like if I know something that might keep my kids from, or anyone, from going off a cliff, Mm-hmm. that it's morally wrong to not share, that there's an option and that option, do you see that cliff ahead? If someone chooses to do whatever, that's their right to yes. choose. But to not share what I have seen work, um, maybe scientifically even with regularity, and just watch something fall apart, I think is just wrong. I agree yeah. with you. And I think that's why we're still compelled that you know, our consciousness is driving us forward you know, what people do with the information is out of our hands. Right. But to to share the information is is a compulsion um, of consciousness that it, if it can prevent someone from going off that cliff or thinking at the edge of the cliff, do I really want to jump? Right. Yeah. You know, then that's uh, 
everything is worth it. So my my father uh, walked him through the end of life. Uh, he'd lived with me for 10 years and I was going through something very difficult. And I said to my dad, oh, why didn't you tell me that life could be so hard? And he laughed and he said, no one told me. Right. <laughs> I, I mean, I didn't have much satisfaction in that, right? Because not only what we share is going to help with the hard stuff, but to let you know that indeed, sometimes life is hard, that we can't always have it good and easy and nice, that we have to have tools for getting through life when it is difficult, because life is this and this and everything in between. Yeah. And it's not um, you're not wrong or failing or doing life wrong because you're going through struggles. Those struggles are just part of being human. They're part of our learning curve. But I think there is a choice whether we're going to suffer through the struggles. That's right. That's right. And, you know, that it, we right. can suffer at those struggles uh, where we take it on emotionally and it absorbs us and we become the suffering instead of looking at the struggle as a challenge. Okay. All right. You know, um, I've been presented with something I don't know if I can do. It's a struggle to get through it. But absolutely everybody, and I've been doing this nearly 11 years, absolutely everybody that has received what I call the cosmic two by four, it means flattened in their lives that they've had to rise from the ashes mm. and come back from some things that are absolutely horrific. They've all said, mm -hmm. I wouldn't change anything for who I am today. All those experiences and the willingness to go through the struggle through the process and become who I am today, doing what I'm doing, I wouldn't change anything. It's really hard to imagine that when you're in it. I know. You know, it's the yeah. interesting part about that. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. It is, um, it, it, you know, it's not a destination, it's a journey. And sometimes yes. it's uphill and sometimes it's downhill. And if you're experiencing life like that, you're not alone. I don't know anyone who doesn't. Um, and that's the flat line. And, and the few, you know, the flat line. That, that's true. Walking I was just, just going to say that, you know. <laughs> right, right. Or living in front of the television or something where there's not, you know, not putting themselves in a place um, to risk having the up and down. Mm. But I, I decided a long time ago, I feel deeply. Um, which means I feel hurt deeply. I feel mm -hmm. disappointment. I feel mm -hmm. all those deeply, but I also feel joy deeply. Mm -hmm. And it's worth it to me to jump into, as Brene Brown would say, the arena, right? And maybe get bloody and messy a little bit to have the experiences and the good things that come out of it. Much like what you said about people who've gone through hardship. I mean, we don't choose hardship, but honestly, I don't know anyone of character who didn't get there because of hardship. Exactly. We can't choose what happens to us, but we can choose what we do with it. Right? That's exactly. You know, and right. I think that who we again, are in that. Who we are in that. And I think, you know, that very much is where that inner conflict comes through. You know, uh, do I seek vengeance? You know, I, to seek mm. justice. Yes. If somebody has wronged you and you don't want them to go on wronging someone else to seek justice. Yes. But if it gets to the point of consuming you and it becomes vengeful and your life cannot move on because of it, then you are remaining the victim. And we <laughs> so many people are living in a victimized <laughs> mode without realizing that uh, they're doing it to themselves over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And uh, that causes so much inner pain. And then, then they get used to the pain. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it becomes their most comfortable place. Mm -hmm. So it's easier to be there. It's kind of the better the devil you know. Yeah. It's easier to be there than risk change and change not working out how they think change should be. Like we don't know till we get there, but we all have a story we tell ourselves. If we can let go of the story and just take the step, um, uh, Thomas Hubel, who is a mystic, says, if you take a step, the ground will appear. Mm -hmm. And you take the step without knowing where it's going to end up. You walk through a door. I think the universe just opens up more and more things that you couldn't dream of because right. you don't know without taking that step.
It's the trust. I call you know stepping out into the abyss, blind, deaf, and dumb, in order to see, hear, and feel. Right? Mm. We we've, we've got to have that trust because, you know, it, quite honestly, when we wake up in the morning, we don't know what's going to happen in that day. Yet we go about our day. Mm -hmm. We you know we we go about our routine, and we kind of hope the day is going to be there for us. But as was proven in the last few years, mm. and really through history. The day can change radically on a dime. And are you ready for it? Are you ready to to face whatever that change is and step into first and foremost the survival mode, you know, and then, you know, the the uh, thrival mode in the sense of what you can do out of it. <laughs> I was going to say the thrival mode, right? Right as it came out of your mouth. That's interesting. I, I would say um, that that for better or worse defines me. My kids mm -hmm. know. I mean, I being in a nursing career for a very long time, I worked in every intensive care unit. I worked in trauma and ultimately the emergency department. And I think sometimes that I have an obsession with making every moment count mm -hmm. because I do know that we don't know for sure that we have the next one because no one came into the emergency room planning on coming in there right. that day. And, so and God, and you see it, things that are literally in the moment, right? A choice in the moment, an action in the moment. All they have in the emergencies for some people is that moment. That's right. And sometimes it's not even anything to do with their choice. Sometimes yeah. they literally are a victim of someone else's choice. But mm -hmm. it just reminds me, and it's in, just in me so deep, how fragile the whole, um, not just the moment, but just fragile, beautiful, and um, grace-filled having the moments while we have them are. You to take the time to appreciate them yes. because they... They may not be there, and we just don't know when that. We don't know when the rug is going to pull that, be pulled out from under us, from you know, illness, from accident, mm -hmm. from uh, anything that can go sideways because it's life. That's life, and I think you know. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, a lot of people think, well, why can't we live in joy all the time? And my mm -hmm. answer to that is. Wouldn't it get boring? Wouldn't you become complacent? And would you lose your gratitude for it? You know, would we know what joy is without right. the opposite. Would the yin yang. Right? I mean, we I, need the yin yang. Right. We need the balance of life to actually right. understand those joyful moments. And we bottle them and we put them in our beautiful hearts. And we and we go back into that memory of those joyful moments. You know, waiting for that other joyful moment doesn't mean all the other moments have to be suffering or struggle. They're just not the high note of the song. Yes, yeah, no, that's that's beautifully said. I think if uh, if if we're looking to find just joy in our life, perhaps it's an invitation to be the joy. Yeah, I choose yes. to be more than that. I am yes. not capable of being joy all the time, but right. for some people, it might be you know kind of feel like who they are. But I think it's fine if that's just, you know, you've got some people, you know, as I was saying earlier, I've got a, a grandson about to be born that has Down syndrome. And we know that one of the gifts of Down syndrome children is they very much live in the moment. And they, you know, they don't mm. kind of carry with them, you know, anything, you know, the past. So they don't carry a lot of the garbage along with them. And they live in that joy and in that moment. And I think, uh, you know, he's here to teach us. Mm to be present. And I think, you know, when we yeah. look at an awful lot of autistic kids, which I've interviewed quite a number of them, you know, the people think, well, they have a disability. And I think when well, they're incredibly gifted, they're, they're only very, very focused on the gift that they've been given, but they're also very selective on whom they have in their circle. And perhaps there's a lesson to be learned there. It's not the amount of likes or the amount of people that follow you or the amount of people that adore you. It's that close circle of people that will always be there for you. Yeah, that, there's times in our lives when that's definitely going to be uh, necessary. I, and thinking of the some people need that and some people need or are drawn to or called to be and live their life a certain way. I mean, I think if we're trying to find our authentic self, that it looks different for all of us. Yeah. If for me, I experience 
we're puzzle pieces. Mm. And we don't resemble each other. In some ways we do because we do fit together. We always have more in common than we mm. do differences, you know. Um, we were born, we breathe, we have parents. I mean, just we have more in common. Um, but but our differences are puzzle pieces. And if we can accept them and not try to make your piece mm. look like mine or yes. make my piece look like yours, we find a way that they come together and they will create a a mosaic or something just absolutely beautiful. I, I believe this. If we can yeah. just find a way to let people find their own authenticity, no matter how different it is from ours. Allow the creative pieces to come together to create a picture. Don't dictate how it should be. The allowing right. yeah. of that creation to come together will always far succeed in the limitations of our dictation. Yeah. And you know what you were mentioning earlier too about um, the with Down syndrome and finding joy and being in the moment. It brought to mind for me. I noticed I have four grandchildren and and they're young and they have a pureness about them. They have a just enthusiasm. They have just this this peace. And I think you know up to a certain age. Everything kids do is adorable. They can't do yes. anything wrong, you know, and then they get a certain age and then they can't do anything right. <laughs> you know, there's, there's all these rules and there's school and everybody telling them what to be. And mm. all of a sudden, oh. everything they do isn't cute anymore. No. And I think of what that must do to our spirit. Like, I just yes. hope for my grandchildren. I didn't see this when I was a mom. Mm. But I think I was a pretty good mom, but... But I see it now and I wonder it for my grandchildren. I don't want them to lose that. I don't want them to lose that. But if we don't watch for that, you know, maybe sometimes we're even why it's lost. I think that's, you know, uh, when I first became a grandmother, you know, I, I said it's different. It's really hard to put into words. You, you're not in the mode of now I am the custodian of this child for the rest of their life. And I've got to make sure they're fed this, that, etc. It is a different relationship, a different vibe. And I think that is, you know, part of being the gift of being a grandparent is to make sure we keep that mm -hmm. spirit alive. We are constantly telling adults, please find your essence the presence of your essence, that your life is lived from inside out, not the exterior, the inside out. Children are already living that. So why are we beating mm -hmm. it out of them only for us adults to s desperately seek it back on again? Why don't you wow. know, I've got a book series coming out later in the year, a collaborative book series on our Forgotten Children series. And it is based on what disservice we are doing to our children by not feeding the seeds that they have sown by nurturing them and letting mm -hmm. them grow. I don't care if they want to be a fireman today, a policeman tomorrow, an astronaut or a hippie. I don't care. Nurture each one of those experiences because it becomes part of the, the, the learning skills that they pack in that backpack of life. And if we could mm -hmm. learn to watch them and learn from them instead of dictating the dysfunctional way of living, which we have taught them in the past, I think we would be much better off as a society. Yes, for sure. The birth of shame. There's something mm. wrong with you, how you are. Yeah. You know, what you're doing is not bad. You are bad. Yes. And goodness knows we give that message to our children. I, My five-year-old grandson is very, very bright. He's, I could tell he was bright since he was an itty bit. You know, every child has their strength. He's, he's just so smart that he gets bored easily. And, um, you know, he is mischievous would be a nice way to describe <laughs> him. But, he, but he's so bright about it. But he's in kindergarten and he's not standing in the line and he's not keeping his hands to himself and he's not doing all these rules. Who decided that that's how you had to be at five years old? Exactly. You know? I had a wonderful uh, educator on a little while ago where she was talking about where this teacher was saying, this child is unruly. This child can't learn this. The child can't do that. And they brought her in and she was out in the hallway with bean bags, and they were looking, what are you doing? And by the time she finished, the child went in and knew exactly what it is they needed to know. And they'd learned a new skill on how to learn it. Is that we've become so linear in the way that we teach. And we've got to understand yeah. that our children are broad spectrum. 
We need to tune into their channel, right. not demand they tune into us. So a lot can okay. be learned from that. And do I you feel find great to... mm -hmm, go ahead? Go ahead. No, no, no please go ahead. Um, I forgot what it's good. <laughs> when it comes back up, let me know. Um, you know, I think a lot of people's conflict, and you may see this in the conflict, is when people are battling with each other, they've forgotten even what they're battling about, but very often it's the wounded child within them that is battling. Do you find that? Yeah, I would say more than very often, probably always. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And then it, what comes out is the skill set we have for for handling conflict. And if it was battling as a child, um, I, I, a lot of times when you watch people talk to each other in conflict, um, I like the family systems theory. There's so many psychological theories that fit together. I use pieces of them, but family systems, you know, there's more than we're parts. We're made yes. up of different parts, right? So there's the parent, there's the child, and there's the adult. And when we're the parent self, we show up and we're like, don't touch that and mm -hmm. stay away from the fire. And I know better than you. It's a talking down. Mm -hmm. Think about when you're arguing with someone, if you're talking with them or at them, talking mm -hmm. down to them, or are you being the child and mm -hmm. sort of, you know, in the corner, letting somebody kind of bully you? Or are you being an adult? And the adult selves, when we meet each other, we talk like we're talking. Mm -hmm. We talk like you would talk to your clergy person or your boss or your neighbor. You know, it's uh, it's it's letting go of the higher than or mm -hmm. lower than mm -hmm. position and coming together. So it's something to notice um, when you notice a regression or you notice you're spiraling into your typical um, younger self reaction person, I, I asked myself, wait, I did it today. Is this the adult me mm -hmm. that's speaking now? Yes. Um, because if I just recognize it's not, there's some relief in that. Then I can go, okay, where is she? Oh, yes. here she is. I'm, you know, there's a beautiful movie that came out some years ago, and I was at the time interviewing a lot of psychologists for some reason. And I said to them, you've got to watch this movie Inside Out. And at that time, I kind of pre-interviewed people before I interviewed them. I wasn't doing so many shows a week as I'm doing now. And uh, when one psychologist came back, she said, thank you. You know, because the Inside Out is about dealing with emotions. And, you know, the parents mm -hmm. just wanting the child to be in joy and the child is going through hurt, anger, this, that, etc. And all of those emotions have a reason. They're an indication of how we feel at the moment. So instead of feeding mm -hmm. the emotion, why are we not looking at what's causing the emotion and deal with it? But, but what we're inclined to do is become emotional about the emotion. Or just feel it. We don't even have to fix it, right? Mm -hmm. So... The one thing I want to say about that feeling is uh, I being in mediation, I hear mediators, you know, so what do you what do you feel now or what's the one thing you feel? We never feel one thing at a time. No. No. And if we're feeling big, you know, it's it's it serves me well to say a part of me is feeling a part of me is feeling angry. A part of me is feeling lonely. Uh, because then it's not so big that I feel like it's going to swallow me, right. you know, when I have those kind of feelings. So I like that you said that all of these all of these feelings come with being human and we do learn mm -hmm. from all of them. Um, and we have to kind of make friends with them all. And know the triggers, as you talked about earlier, the triggers, you know, OK, that's just triggered something that really had nothing to do with me. This person mm -hmm. isn't out attacking me. It's just something they said or did has triggered a memory, right? right? right. So, you know, That's just right. pause again, pause again before you go down the rabbit hole or you get angry, pause, because really all it is is a memory that's coming up and you've gone into the right. defense. Let it go. <laughs> it's somehow easier to blame someone else mm. for what your reaction is. I like, um, I tell a story sometimes, um, so there's a book, The Dance of Anger. I think it's by Helene Brenner, if I have that right. And she says, you know, if you're the one experiencing the problem, then it's your problem to solve. It's not the other person. Mm -hmm. And I tell the story about 
driving down the highway, I'm always 100 miles an hour in everything I do. <laughs> I'm a pretty calm, nice person, but I have road rage <laughs> and I don't like traffic at all. And my partner just, you know, kind of toots along, you know, and I'm, I'm going like this in the car and I want to be like, what's wrong? Go faster. But then I stop and say, wait, he's happy. I have the problem. It's mm -hmm. my problem to solve. It's not up to him to do something different so that I feel better. Right. It's up to me to do something different so that, that I feel better. But it, it, the blame, the other thing is blame. It's back to blame again, which is so quick to happen because in a second it feels better. You know, it's just Renee Brown says it's a, a quick um, offshoot of pain and put it on someone else. Yes. But long term, our short term fixes sometimes cause long term damage. They're quick and easy. A little more work and we'll have better outcomes. And I think that's what it takes to handle conflict well. It's when somebody says something to you that they can never come back from. They've said it in a moment of rage. They want to put you down. They want to put you in your place. And they've said something that cannot be taken mm. back. And it doesn't and matter I, how sorry they are or anything else. What right. you know, they what they've just said. You know, we, we have a saying when I was growing up, one nail too many in the coffin. Yeah. Right? I want to speak to that because I tell people, so that comes, what people say from a place of trigger, I hate you. I've always hated you. You're a horrible person. Whatever it says, we tend to go, oh, now I know what you really think. Yeah. Well, it's the farthest thing from the truth. It's not, they're not thinking, they're reacting. Mm -hmm. And if we cannot wear that mirror that someone's holding up, it's not, that's not what they mean. If we can see that that's a reaction to pain, they don't mean that now. Check in with them when they're calm 10 minutes later and ask, did you mean that? Because those things don't have to destroy relationships. They don't have to be walls that we can never take down again. They can be a moment that we recognize as a bad way of handling conflict. We probably all have the moment we've said things that we wish we could take back. And how do we move past that? Because when we learn to move past that, we can keep our relationships instead of, I can't be friends with you. I can't be related with to you. I can't, you know, because people have stepped on our toes. What happens when you're dealing with a narcissist that is then denial? I didn't say that. Yeah, that's, uh, that's crazy making, isn't it? No, like no, it's no. crazy making. So we've all had those people in our lives. And when I got more healthy in me, um, meaning knew more who I was, I can, again, that mirror holds up, whether the mirror is reflecting, oh, this is what happened. And if I'm good with me, I know it's not true. Right. So I don't wear it. I don't own it. So um, <laughs> that, I spent plenty of time with, a, with a, someone with high narcissistic tendencies. I like to say that instead of labeling someone a narcissist for this reason. None of us, all of us are as narcissistic when we're in pain because yes. when we're in pain, it's all about us. And right. we slide along the narcissism scale. And some people live there and they don't look like they're in pain. They look like they like themselves a whole mm -hmm, lot. Mm -hmm, the rest mm -hmm. of the world should too. And I couldn't wrap my head around that that person was in, in pain too. So I spent a lot of time going, no, no, the sky's not purple. It really is blue because, see, it says here in this book, you know, trying to prove to someone nobody changes their mind that way. Nobody. No. But to say, OK, I know what color the sky is. And if you want to call it purple, that's yours. Like you can have that. But we feel really threatened when people see things differently than us. It's hard to get confident with, okay, what I see is real and it's okay if it's different from yours. And I think, you know, well, I mean, I, I was married to one and, um, and it, it got to a point that um, I had to realize I was handing him the boots he was putting on and kicking me, but I had to take my ownership in it. That, you know, uh, I was reacting. You gave me goosebumps. 
<laughs> you gave me goosebumps because then for them, you do become, they, they push all the buttons. Yes. They push all the buttons and then they sit back and go, well, aren't you the crazy one? Right. Yes. <laughs> you see what I'm talking about. Right. And yes. it's, yeah, yeah. And it's just all spiraled down. Yeah. yeah. It's like yeah. you don't have to engage. You just don't. don't have to engage. But it turns out in relationships, we want people to see things the way mm. we do. And honestly, if you're always so far apart that somebody can't hold up a mirror and reflect the same world that you're seeing to some degree, probably don't want to stay there. No, I, But if I, it's I, just uh, sometimes we don't see the same thing, that's okay. And, you know, and, and from being in it uh, for a long time and kind of feeling I was the problem, um, you know, it, mm. it was, I was less than, um, you know, letting it erode me, erode me, and then slowly kind of coming back out of that darkness and, you know, stepping mm -hmm. up into more confidence. It was then when I asked for the divorce, it's like he blamed somebody who had... Um, done something for me a therapy for me uh you know that bloody woman she took the control i had over you away from me mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. i'd taken mm -hmm. back my yeah. control and with that i would say to him the only person interested in that comment is your mirror i'm not <laughs> and so but it took no, 22, that's beautiful 22 years after our mm -hmm. marriage and we, we walked our daughter down the aisle together you know, we, we attend the family functions um, and it, we're clearly chalk and cheese. It was actually my children that asked me to get a divorce. And it was 22 years later, he said, I'm sorry, I never should have married your mother. I'm not marriage material and I was not kind to her. But it took 22 years to get there. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, but I wasn't, oh, I wasn't waiting for that. You know, it was... You know, and my response mm -hmm. to that was, mm -hmm. yes, and the scars are there and they will always be there. But it's up to each and every one of us mm -hmm. to find healing for our own selves. Right. So mm -hmm. we, mm -hmm. we may have been scarred by someone, but we've, we've got to be careful of those scars are always going to be there. They're scars. But we don't have to let ourselves be defined. You know, it's like any mm -hmm. struggle. I was in strife and then I struggled to come through that suffering and strife. And I became a better person because of it. Concentrate on who you have become rather than That's right. what somebody else tried to mold you to be. So it circles around. I hear your story and it circles around to what you said a while back about people coming out of hardship saying, I would have gone through that again for how I became. That's bold because I don't know, you know, wanting to go through it. But you can still not want to go through it, but yes. recognize that going through it had right. had value. No, um, I won't yeah, repeat I, my experience. Let me tell you. No. I am not going back to repeating I, it. But it has made me who I am today. So whether right, it was that right. experience wish, or another experience like that, you're right. I wish there was an easier way to get where we go, but there's not. It's the way that it is. But again, but we got think, to somewhere. That, from, you know, like what you're doing now in this podcast and sharing that wisdom and the work that you do in sharing the wisdom instead of retiring and off on a nice boat somewhere, <laughs> you know, is because you're giving people the thoughts, the skills and the tools to recognize those things that are wrong so they don't have to go down the suffering. You know, they right, may struggle right. to kind of leave that situation and move into a different sphere, but with that awareness hang on this is wrong i wish i had had these type of shows when i was going through it mm. because then it would have been like yeah. no this isn't normal no 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 nobody has the, the the right to define who you are only you can define who you are and it would have given me more courage and strength to stand up for myself earlier or to recognize that this is just a situation that needs to come to an end we this is the reason why we do what we're doing instead of just basking in our own you know mm -hmm. lunches mm -hmm. with friends mm -hmm. and things like that yeah. is because if they know <laughs> how to recognize something then they know how to prevent it going down the rabbit hole and struggling and suffering so much more to come back out do you know what i find out too though is there's so many people i mean as far as normal goes abnormal is normal to yes, some degree is. if that makes yes. sense yes yes because absolutely. when you come out and you when we start talking about these things when we bring them to light 
we find out we're not alone. Right. There's a lot of people going through the same things. There's a lot of people struggling with the same thing. So to some degree, it must be normal, but, you know, or at least part of life. But bringing it to light and finding the tools to do it better is is the key or a key maybe to, um, you know, we're, having we're a better outcome. We're changing what's like normally you accepted. That's right. The reason oh, it, about- it became, yeah. But the reason it became normal because we didn't talk about it and because we kept right. it to ourselves and we just accepted it, bringing it to the forefront now. I mean, look at your Harvey Weinsteins, look at, you know, all the, the sexual exploitation that went on in that world. And a few brave women brought it to light and they had to go through scrutiny mm-hmm. and suffering and persecution and everything. But what it did, it wrong. It, it righted the wrongs of what these people were doing mm-hmm. and it's brought an acceptance and tolerance level as to what we will not allow because it's brought mm-hmm. it into the light. And I think the more we bring things into the light, we denormalize the abuse and we right. start normalizing the empowerment of coming together, not with the pitchforks, but in support of one another in this in mm-hmm. being the strength of one another and even letting a friend know look i'm sorry darling but you know what you're going through right now isn't normal you know if the, this is this is going to hurt you how can we empower you to take back your own power and we need to be there for each other not by wronging what the other person is because they're going through their own struggle and that's why they're imposing it you know, we, we always impose the most pain on the person we love the most right It's the situation, the cloud, the pain that's got in the way of the love. And if we can diminish that pain or reveal that pain, then maybe the love has a chance. We can't see what's good anymore when we're in pain. We only see the pain. We only see what's, we only see the poke. You know, an interesting thing about that. Uh, that I do believe, and this is part of the reason I do what I do. I, working on, uh, to some degree, an international level of conflict, the big picture, the wars, are a macrocosm of our own two people, family, neighborhood, town, homeowners association. It's just a bigger scale of the exact same way of handling conflict. Mm -hmm. So I think if we can learn, like you mentioned, starting with you and Mm -hmm. seeing who am I in the conflict? Can I learn to do it better? And one person at a time, I feel like I'm like, I'm a bottom up, I'm a grassroots, you know, one person at a time, we can make a difference because I do believe that there are far more good people in the world. They're not making headlines. No. Um, but we 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 need to reassure. We need to keep growing that. I mean, what will grow is what is planted, the seeds we plant. And if we plant blame and if we mm. plant victimhood, which is readily available to plant them, versus planting agency, you know, finding who you are, allowing people to be who they are. And that doesn't mean that everything's okay. It's not in a kumbaya sort of no. way because sometimes, sometimes love is tough. Love is honest even when it's hard. Yes. You know? Yes. But if we can dare those things, then maybe peace will grow in my couplehood, in my household, and that will spread to somewhere else. And eventually maybe we can get the world. And as I say that, I heard the other day that there's 4% of people that are just mean people, 4%, right? So there will always be those mean yes. people, I think. Um, yeah, 4%. What did, I always wondered what that was. I, I, I have to see and if they I become in the leadership roles, right? Because they're they manipulators, do. right? Yes. You know, I, that, I love what you're saying. A- I, yeah, I love what you're saying. Everything what you're saying, 100 trillion percent agree with. We've actually got to actually understand at the present moment, there is a current, a very strong current of consciousness arising. All right. And that consciousness is, is that in order to know love, we must be love. In order to have peace, we must be the peace. Right. And uh, that we may not like something about ourselves, a tendency, a, you know, a, a, a thought, but that doesn't mean we don't love ourselves. We may not like, and this is something I always used to do with my children. I used to watch some parents, you know, talk about love as a condition. If you do something wrong, I won't love you. 
And that mm-hmm. always horrified me because I would say to my children, you're a complete idiot. What were you thinking about? I totally disapprove of what you did, but that's got nothing to do with what or how I love you. Nothing to do with it at all. And they all made decisions that were rather idiotic because for me it was, here is your boundary. If you're going to push beyond your boundary, understand you're the one that's going to pay the price and you've got to decide if that price is worth paying or not. And they push those boundaries. And sometimes they pay some prices they didn't want because to pay. Because they're human. Because they're human. But that's right. they always came back to the core of love because that was my generator. I was completely flawed as a mother and as a woman because I was going through such turmoil myself at that time. And, yeah. you know, taken a long time to discover who Sarah is and what Sarah stands for. It, it, who I stand for and what I am has always been there. But it was always apologetically given because I never felt it was enough. Mm. And now I am what mm. I am, as Popeye says. If it's not enough, seek someone else because I'm giving. I love like that. I, I love that because that ties into you said, um, you know, we may not like who we are. And, and I'm thinking that kind of goes, if we go down that train, then it means I have to be perfect to like who I am. And I want to suggest you do like yourself, even though you're flawed. I look at some of what my flaws are. I mean, and I'm finally accepting it's we, it's more so lovable to be flawed are. than to be perfect, right? Yes. Like, I mean, nobody loves anybody who's perfect, but why do we keep striving to not make mistakes, to get it right, to never mess up? And I'm starting to sometimes at least be, be able to shrug and say, oh, well, I had this thought. I'm ashamed that I had this thought because you shouldn't think like that. And I'm yeah. like, I'm human, you know, I'm human. And I think giving ourselves that kind of grace, it doesn't mean you act on it. Maybe you have right. to make amends if you do, because you you might, we might. Yeah. <clears throat> but, um, you know, not there's no value in beating ourselves up or beating up anyone else. There's a beautiful word going around, which I've adopted and made it kind of an anthem. Be flawsome. Oh, that's, I like that. Right? Because I like that. we've all got flaws. I'm going to write right? that down. But when we look at a diamond and the diamond that's worth the most is the one that has a flaw in it. Right? right. So why can't we be awesome with our quirky flawsomeness? That doesn't right. mean we're just feeding the flaws of us. But what we're doing is we're recognizing those cracks in our own diamond. We're recognizing that's we right. have a tendency to something. We, we, our quirkiness. You know, in your cities, that we, that's what makes us who we are. But why can't we be awesome in that flawsomeness? Right, right. That's exactly right. I'd like to, um, if I may, leave or, uh, yeah, share a gift with the people who, with your followers. Yes, and also um, want to talk about your book as well, because we haven't got there yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll do that another time. But <laughs> this is it was some of the things we've talked about character, we've talked about values. And there's this really fun tool that takes about 10 minutes online. It's called it's VIA character.org. VIA character.org. It's a scientifically validated, it's very sound, but it takes takes a list of, I believe, 25 character values like honesty, beauty, creativity. And you answer these questions and it rates your uh, character strengths. Now, people are always telling us what we do wrong. Mm-hmm. You get to look at a piece of paper that we all have some of these 25. It ranks them in order of most important. Mine, I found out my number one one was love of learning. And I'm like, oh, that explains yes, a lot because sense. I would be a lifelong student. If I could. <laughs> yeah. But from our strengths, we can decide who will be in any given moment. So if it's honesty, if it's fairness, justice is one. Where is it coming in the way of you know, that of how you're interacting or your disappointment or your expectation and where and how can it serve you better? 
Yeah. I agree. So, I'm, a, I'm a true colors coach and in understanding our own personality trait, we actually yeah. understand how we receive and perceive information. And if we actually understand that, then we know what like that is my perception. It may not be somebody else's. Let me listen to what this person is saying and I can identify from which perception they're speaking. And then we learn to be more giving instead of so, you know, steadfast. But yes, please, before we go, do tell us about the book. Oh, so it's How to Live Forever, a guide to writing the final chapter of your life story. And uh, for me, working in critical care like I have, I've always viewed people when they die as a book. I just mm. in my head, I've seen like a book closing and wondering what's inside. So we are living our story every single moment. We get to decide who we're going to be in that story. And this book is about preparing the end of life and writing your life story well all the way to the end. So there are um, the legal documents you need to talk through that, healthcare decisions, which I am passionate about having those conversations for a lot of reasons, um, choosing your end of life ceremony, leaving your story as your legacy, because it's more important to people than leaving your gnomes and your rock collection. And um, and then finally, then finally, yeah, we we know this to be true. So and then finally, um, tools to heal relationships because in the world now where we're firing, I call firing people who we don't get along with. A lot of people are ending up alone. Yes, and with regret. Mm. So and then I talk about mediation as a tool for having all of these challenging conversations. I love the <clears throat> the whole end. I mean, let's look at our lives. <clears throat> they are just various chapters in our own book of life. That's right. And, you know, when somebody goes, they're going to remember this or that of you. But actually having a book where you've, you've laid down things that you want them to know, you know, uh, not just the will and leaving this and leaving that, but, you know, more the story behind that, the memories behind that, how how these people that you're leaving behind has made you feel, how, what impact has it had on your life is such a beautiful, long lasting gift to leave people yes. behind. Right. And it's like, yes, yes you, your vessel is going to go. That's the human body. It has a lifetime uh, expansion, um, but the spirit will go on. And the your spirit story that, is sorry. It's ongoing, ongoing, right? The story is ongoing. Your story is your legacy. Yes. Exactly. It is ongoing. It's a tie between the past and the future. I mean, story is incredible. It's knowing it's so the future knows where they came from. I mean, there's yeah. we could talk about story for an hour. It's a pretty exciting topic. Yeah. But, and, yeah. and of course, storytelling is what we're all about here. And the thing is, is that when somebody we've got to remember the impact that we've had on people is held right here, close to their chest in that beautiful mm -hmm. heart memory. And when we've left somebody you know, with a beautiful heart memory, that means they will live on for as long That's as right. that person lives on and how they leave that That's chapter right. behind. And it's like, we're not linear, we're not straight line people, we're beautifully complex. You know, we are that beautiful, That's flawsome right. creature. And somebody's going to remember this of you and somebody's going to remember that. And when people get around that fireplace and share those beautiful memories, you know, the essence of you, <clears throat> is out in the ether and you will continue to live on right exactly exactly decide who you're going to be in every single moment every interaction with another person moves on through their life it's just uh, it's just a chain reaction yeah and who do you want to be to other people how do you want to be remembered yes yeah. They, and what was that lovely song, you know, will you still love me? Will you still want me when I'm 65? I remember when I was younger thinking, well, who will I be at 65? You know, what will be my legacy? What, will, what would I have contributed? And, you know, I started this at, uh, doing this at 57. I've done lots of other things. But this is, for me, my mo most meaningful in, in career-wise. And it's a... Uh, and I had no idea what I was doing when I started off. I mean, everything mm. has just been kind of like by the seat of my pants. But <clears throat> what I've learned about humanity and just how awesome we really are, just how incredible we really are, how resilient we really are, how creative we really are, how loving we really are, and just how divine we really are. 
And that when we decide to step into any of that and embrace that journey, the current, the current of life will propel us forward uh, into a better place. And this is what really life is all about right now and why you and I in our 60s are, and people in their 70s and 80s and even 90s are still being called to contribute because the wisdom of leave the pain behind, embrace the wonderment of life, rise up to that higher frequency of love and vibration, carrying and compassion and creativity, and you will see life as you are really meant to see it. But we've got to look at that conflict within us and around us and understand what it is and let it go. That was inspirational and hopeful, mm. what you said. I'm an optimist. <laughs> I believe we can. And I believe that it's, right. it's you know, people will point finger and believe what well, that person needs to do or they need to do it first. No, if we want government, corporation and society to change, we need to be that change within ourselves. As right. we change, That's as you said before, the ripple effect, the change of the impact that it has all around us. So if we want okay. to see more compassion in the world, let us be compassionate. Starting with ourselves. Give ourselves a break. Stop beating yourself up so much, right? Embrace your flawsomeness. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So what kind of clients do you serve and how do people reach you? <clears throat> and also, how do they buy so best, uh It's on Amazon. Well, actually, any major bookseller. So it's uh, anywhere where you order books. If, you, if it's at a bookstore that you go to, they would probably have to order it in. Uh, Best Conflict Solutions is my company, so www.bestconflictsolutions. If you Google Kimberly Best, you will find me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, and your LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, mm -hmm. all of those. And uh, and the book, you know, I think that's a great gift to, to give um, anyone. Look, you know, today we're not promised tomorrow, as we said earlier. That's exactly right. We're not promised right. tomorrow. And is that... Uh, we see a lot of young people dying and leaving young children behind. Well, that doesn't mean you can't leave, you know, that, that wonderful story. So it's never too early or too late. That's right. To start That's right. preparing your story for, for the end of your chapter, right? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And I have a study guide on my website too for groups. Mm -hmm. And truly, if you have a group that wants to do this, um, because it has been done before, Send me an email and I'm happy to pop in on one of the chapters and facilitate that mm. that week or however you do it discussion. It's always fun to to meet um, readers and people who are working through the book. So yes. let me know if I can help and I'll do my best. Exactly. Um, you know, I encourage book clubs and I encourage podcast clubs. Um, where you know people listen mm. to the podcast and then come together and discuss it afterwards again all those different perspectives of what people got out of it you know and there's that full recipe and that yummy dish for everyone to dive into so I think we've been so told to hold it together keep it together you know nobody's interested in your pain and now we're saying to people share it okay share it uh, so don't be afraid to share it and let it go. So the book is on Amazon, folks, How to Live Forever, Kimberly Best. The site is bestconflictsolutions.com. LinkedIn, Kimberly Best Mediator. Twitter, Kimberly at A Best. <laughs> uh, Best Conflict and Solutions on Facebook. Instagram, Kimberly A Best. And reach out to in any which way that you can. Um, get the book. It's a great gift to give to people. <clears throat> and make sure that we are... Uh, are out there resolving those conflicts within ourselves and with each other and just simply being kinder to each other. Thank you so much for sharing with us, Kimberly. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Until next time, folks, give peace a chance. Bye for now. We hope that you enjoyed the show. Find all of our shows on selfdiscoverymedia.com under podcasts or selfdiscoverymedia slash shows. And for all our current shows, go to What's New. We are supported by you, the audience. You will see a nice big shiny blue button for one-time donations or follow us on Patreon and you will be able to support us there. We enjoy bringing you such wisdom. And the next show will be up in just a moment.